Um, also, <laughs> the, the new mine and Nancy's term expires the end of December. And if anybody would like to put their self up for nomination for an officer on the board, we do have one opening, the first vice president, and then mine and Nancy's positions are open. Anybody's interested in that? <laughs> if not, well, I guess we, I, I don't know, since most of us are board members, I guess we can take a vote if you agree that Nancy and I should may, remain in our positions for another two years. I make a motion here that the officer stay the same as last year. I second it. Thank you. All in favor, raise your hand. Okay. <laughs> and, and if you know of anybody that's interested in joining the board, like I say, we do have one position available, and I know we had a person that would like to step down, but so far she does a good job, so we'll keep her. <laughs> <coughs> And then the last time we talked about the Presbyterian Church, that's, um, that's really our focus. It was our focus last year. We still haven't done anything. Mm -hmm. Linda has contact with someone that is interested in perhaps painting the church and maybe even finishing out the inside. There's flooring that needs to be put back in place. I think. I think the flooring is there, isn't it, Miller? Didn't you remember it? Uh, at least some of it. I'm not. I don't know whether it's all there or not. There's a big gap on one mm -hmm. side of, of the church. Did you say there's someone that expressed an interest in doing that? Yes, Linda knows someone that uh, she's contacted. What we, our initial thing is to get the church painted. So. It looks nice to the public, and uh, that's our main focus. Uh, Nancy's going to give us a report on <coughs> our financial situation, and uh, but this this person Linda's talked to might even be interested in doing the inside also. And eventually, maybe we could have a a little museum. Nancy and I were at a book signing at the Denton Courthouse Museum last Saturday, and um, the lady from Crumb that runs the museum over there, she was telling us they, um, didn't she say the city donated the building to them? Uh, it was the bank. The uh, bank. Uh, maybe the bank. Okay. And I've never been there, but I've heard it's very nice. She just opens one day a week. And I think there's enough of us that surely we could run a museum one day a week, one maybe a Saturday or a Friday or something. I know I, I would be willing to help out on something like that. And she she also told us that she if someone calls and wants to see it, it's not the day they open it. She's not busy. She'll go down there and open it up for them. But you know we have some things and. I think if we had a museum, people would be more willing to donate things that could go in it. But we have all the display cases that came from the Denton County Museum that shut down a couple of years ago, and they're all stored in the in the church. So we have a good start, but it's just right now our focus is getting outside of it because it, it's. In sad shape. Okay, I guess uh, Nancy can give us the report on the treasurer's report. Can oh, tell me behind the wood, is there glass behind the wood or is it, are the windows gone? There are, aren't there some windows? Uh, Where are um, the stained there's glass? There's one here. The glass. There's one. There's a store sometimes. I think there were a couple of stained glass windows on the yeah. south side. I mean, that's something that he can do. I mean, he just got things done in my mom's house for me. And he can do all that. 
windows, the, you know. And I think it's something that, you know, I, I don't know what his regular business is, but. Uh, school teacher. Oh. <laughs> so maybe this is something he could do uh -huh. in his free time. Uh -huh. Okay, thanks. Um, I, I started it with this time a year ago, the last time I gave a report. <laughs> so that last year is on the one side and then the new one, uh, this year is on the other side. Our current balance is $12,090.24. We ordered 400 books and we have sold 321 of them. Plus we have got $743.98 in royalties from books that have been sold in other places. We get 10% royalties. Uh, that's basically what I need to tell you about it, unless you have some questions. I also um, should mention that it's time now to pay dues for next year, for 2013, and there are $10 per adult. So whenever you're ready, I'll take your money. <laughs> and Betty's going to send order forms out to the membership list next week or so. And so when you get the form, you can mail us your check or pay the night, whenever. Okay, I, does anybody have anything they want to discuss? I mean, that's really all I have on my list. How much was it wrong? Is that I need that? $743.98. And just so you know, the um, Purple Umbrella, they've been very good about promoting our book last, um, this time last year, they started selling the books at the same time we did. And I've gone in several times. They, I was in there about a month ago and they still have the book rack set up. So if you know of anybody that wants a book, we have some here at the library, but the library doesn't sell them, but you know, we have some in our storage. And, or you can <coughs> send a request to our P.O. box or go to the Purple Umbrella because we do, we do get proceeds from what they sell. But they, they've been very good about promoting our book. And I think there's a few stores in Denton recycle books and I think Sam's had them for a while. But anyway, we've I think we've done very well on the books to have sold as many as we did. And we we got out there what we wanted. We wanted to capture these pictures for our history. And <coughs> I think the people that are interested in the history, most of them have gotten the book, and that's that's what what's important that we have it. Now, Craig Wagner is going to come up and talk to us and we're just he's going to talk a little bit about his history with volunteer fire department and then um, as as we go along however he wants to do it well if we have questions or comments or funny stories we'll, we'll open it up and we appreciate you coming <clears throat> And you can sit or stand. Uh, How do you want I'll to stand. Okay. Um, first of all, thank you for asking me to come. Um, if uh, you indeed want to revisit this in the spring, then uh, let me know and I'll put an entire program together and I'll get some people from the past and, and I'll just do the whole thing if you want. If you want, just let me know if you want to okay. do that. Okay. Um, but uh, what I can tell you is I got into the fire department in 1979, uh, just got out of high school. I got in on my 18th birthday because you had to be 18, uh, July the 7th or whatever the uh, meeting night was in, in, in July, uh, first one after I turned 18 and I got in. At that point, um, the way to get into the fire department was um, you were voted in by the membership. Um, if you had somebody in there that you knew, my brother happened to be in at the time, and I knew some of the other people, and I kind of snuck up there when I was 
15 or 16 and rode out on the truck a little bit. And, and uh, you know, uh, Merwin was the chief, Merwin Tucker, some of y'all know him. Uh, when I got in, uh, Johnny Looper was the chief. Uh, Billy Jack Looper was the assistant chief. Jimmy Smith was a captain, and I think that's about as far as it went. The y'all were talking about officers a while ago. And at that point in time, and, and, a, and so a couple of years after that, the easiest way to become an officer in the fire department was not show up for a meeting. <laughs> because if you didn't show up, it, everybody knew when officer elections was, and that was the biggest attendance we had. We'd do it in October, and that was the biggest attendance to meetings that we had, because if you didn't show up, you were guaranteed to be an officer. Uh, and uh, the uh, voting in process, like I said, you had to, it's helped you know, knew somebody, and we'd have people come in that would be interested in it, and uh, so it was basically a popularity contest. And uh, pretty much the fire department at that point and years before that was pretty much a, a men's club, you know, uh, that fought fires. And uh, they, you know, at that point in time, uh, 70s, mid 70s, uh, were making maybe 150 fires a year or less. Um, the alarm system at the time when I got in was consisted of what we call fire phones. And some of y'all may remember the fire phones, but um, when you joined the fire department, the uh, call the phone company and they went down to the switching house that was right down there on, uh, what street is that? Right between 2nd and 3rd street. 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 That was the switching house down there. And they would go down there and they'd put some kind of jumper in your phone line and it was a great big conference call at that point because you know it wasn't nothing, wasn't nothing uh, digital. It was all analog and, and rotary dial. And if you was, you know if you was uptown, you had a push button phone. But you know they were all this big and this thick. I saw one other day at my mother-in-law's garage sale, and I thought, man, I can't believe we used to talk on that thing. <laughs> but anyway, and what would happen is if some of you may have called in fires at that, Mrs. Wiley probably has it you know, back then. But when you dialed. The number was 3333, and of course, you know, back then you didn't have to dial 458. So you dial 3333, and the sound you heard was a big, long, you know, how you just go, you know, a big, long one of them. And that's all you heard until all the firemen started picking up their phones at home. And when it would ring at my house, it was a it was half rings ring 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 so you know it was the fire phone and uh, when you when you firemen would pick up the phone and usually the third or fourth one would say Sanger Fire Department and uh, the person reporting the fire would uh, say yeah there's a, a grass fire out here uh, on the way place okay so nowadays you know you live at your address and. You know, they took the routes, route one box, this and that, took them away a few years ago. And uh, so I get, I'll come back and touch on that in a minute. Anyway, they'd say, okay, there's a grass fire out here on the way place. So, you know, we knew where the way place was, you know, and there's maybe one of two, the way place out off, way out by the long bottom, or the way place, you know, that uh, Jack Wade lived on. So everybody hang the phone up. You know, and here we everybody go to the fire station. Get up there and uh, get in the trucks and go. Um, There's a lot of transition went on uh, between 1970 and starting when when I got on. Um, there was there still is. There's a fire training school at Texas A&M University every summer, and I think they just had the 90, almost 100 years of it. So it started a long, long time ago. And uh, I went the first time when I was uh, after about 1981, after I'd been in a couple of years. And it was a week-long school in the heat of the summer in College Station, Texas. And you can imagine, if you've ever been down there in the summertime, it's, it's terrible hot. And so, so a couple of us went to that, and uh, the young guys, we got in. There was the average longevity of the guys that were in there was around between 25 and 30 years. They'd already been in there that long since, so you're looking at the late 50s when they got them. Um, so
So we came back from A&M ready to go, you know, go, and we was ready to train, and we was going to show these guys what to do. Well, it's kind of like beating your head on that wall right there, uh, because, you know, they knew what to do, and, you know, if the house is on fire, you get around it with all your water hoses, and you just, you know, <laughs> wait for it to burn up through the roof, and, and then put it out. Yeah, save the chimney, you know. And uh, anyway, we come back, and we started to, you know, a little bit of training here and there. And as the as the years went by, we, of course, made more runs. And uh, some of the guys realized that uh, this is kind of dangerous. You know, we got to see more stuff and more, uh, uh, of course, fire service, you know, whether you're uh, doing the medical part of it or not, you see death and destruction. And as we were seeing more and more of that, and, you know, some of the guys said, yeah, hey, this is kind of dangerous. So the... Uh, Next transition was to uh, start to start, you know, kind of start training the people. And we would have training meetings the, the second and fourth Tuesdays of every month. And uh, a lot of times those would just kind of be a pool shooting tournament and a cussing contest. And, a, uh, you know, um, and we maintained the trucks. We maintained all our own trucks. Uh, had. I myself, I was a, I started as a mechanic, my first job. So Jimmy Smith, you know, some of y'all remember him. He had a shop here in town, and we maintained all our own trips, all our own trucks. Um, we were a city department, but we weren't a city department. The city furnished us with a place to put our trucks, and they bought the gas for them. And I'm not sure how much further it went than that, but. Anyway, uh, we, of course, worked off donations. The county of Denton would pay us uh, a lump sum. Usually, I think it was at that point, it was like $3,000 a year. And then they would pay us uh, $20 a run to the county. And uh, that was our money. And we had fund, you know, fundraisers. We had a, a Miss Flame contest, some of y'all's. Daughter's mail, and it was in the Miss Flame contest. Uh, it was uh, a beauty pageant that uh, was was uh, popular back in that day. Um, one night, uh, Merwin came into the meeting, and he had a letter that was about ten pages long. And uh, do y'all remember a man named? I think his name was Jesse Seals. Mail carrier. Okay. He was in the fire department way back there when uh, I'm not sure if he was in when Bud General was in, but he was in there with Andy Wayne Wilson and Willie Keith Pate and James Reddy, Dick Reddy, and uh, some more. And uh, I always, I always heard that that was the the high times of the, of the fire department because they had a lot of fun. But anyway, he had this letter, and Jesse Seals had retired and moved away. And he had sat down, and he said that he wanted to write down everything that he did in the fire department and everything that went on. And I don't, I don't know where that letter is today. Merwin may have it. I want to see if he's got it. But I would read it to you, and you would roll in the floor laughing. Because it mentioned kangaroo court. If you said a cuss word in the fire station, you went to kangaroo court. And uh, we just was, I mean, it was 10, 10 pages long or more, and we just sat there and listened to all that. We just, it was just, you know, a fix to it. But uh, I'm not sure the outcome of the kangaroo court, but you, it all involved money. Every time you said a cuss word in the fire station, you had to put a quarter in a coffee can, and that bought, you know, that bought supper at the end of the whatever. Or, anyway, the uh, fire department had a deer, had its own deer lease. The guys liked to deer hunt until one of them shot a calf <laughs> at the deer lease. It was at Jacksboro. And uh, one of them shot a deer, and there would be a, about a 750 pound calf standing behind it, and he killed the calf. So, anyway, that ended the deer lease. Uh, they, they knew it wasn't a deer. <laughs> well, it was standing behind the deer. <laughs> I'm not, I don't know the that. I just know the outcome. But anyway, uh, 
Was that the start of the barbecue you have? <laughs> somebody a training officer and uh, in the uh, probably mid 80s we changed the process of voting into an application process of course there wasn't any wasn't any money involved well let's take that back when I got in we got a dollar a meeting and a dollar a fire and that was paid to us and if you made lots of calls and you have a good you know you get that pay pay everybody at the, at the Christmas party and uh, you know you grind up at you know seventy five eighty dollars you know or whatever maybe one hundred twenty five but uh, anyway that's what was that was what was paid to us we found out later that that was basically illegal but <laughs> <laughs> we kept you know we did it, you know nobody else nobody said anything so uh, anyway um, equipment we uh, had hand me down equipment from, from Denton. And surrounding places, and, uh, nobody matched. <laughs> uh, the first round of equipment that we bought, personal equipment, was uh, yellow fire coats and uh, new boots, rubber boots. And the rubber boots we wore were what's called three quarter boots, and you roll the top down and kind of sleeved it inside itself. You pulled your boot on, and then you pulled it up, and it come up to about the top of your thigh. And then you had a long coat that come down to almost your knees. And then your helmet, and that's in gloves, and that's all you had. And it's, it's far short of what they wear today, I guarantee you. But, how, many, uh, how many trucks did you have? We had, sorry, we had, uh, a, we had that 47 Chevrolet truck that's in that picture. We had a 56 Ford pumper. Uh, we had an old Army surplus Jeep. We had a, an old army truck that we had a big 2,500 gallon tank on that would never run. <laughs> uh, Bill Schweitzer was a county commissioner at that time and he had a line on all this military equipment. And he would come driving up in it one day and said, I got y'all a new truck. And, oh, thank you. you know. <laughs> and uh, anyway, we did the best we could. You know, we built all our own, you know, except for the, the trucks that we bought. Uh, that was already built. We built our own stuff. And uh, that 56 Chevrolet replaced the 27 model Southern. And it's in one of those pictures, that long picture at the bottom of that, uh, that board back there. And uh, so uh, trucks were, you know, by that today's standards, you know, they were pennies, but they were expensive back then. Uh, the training. We went on with the training. Um, when I went to start going to a &M every year, and uh, a, another revolution came around in the fact that uh, we started letting people on that men on that were firemen somewhere else, like in Denton, uh, different places, and uh, we uh, had a little rebellion, you know. Uh, when they started wanting to come in, uh, some of the older guys, did, you know, they didn't didn't think they were uh, valuable to us because of you know conflict and uh, well, they're they're farming there and they don't you know we do it the way this we want to do it here so anyway. Uh, now you know I've met people that were farming in other towns coming volunteering. Here. Yeah, that live here. You know, and they work, you know, the, the paid fire department okay. schedule is work 24 and be off 48 hours. So they had two days off and they would come to calls, uh, you know, when they were off. So those come in and, and uh, several of those, my brother was one of them, and, uh, but they, they turned, you know, some of them, some of the guys are just wasn't cut out to be firemen. Uh, or that's generally, that's not just the paid guys, but uh, some of them just, just, you know, didn't like it when they uh, got, scared the first time or saw a, a you know a, a morbid scene at one time or another they decided it wasn't for them. Uh, I had a lot of people, I can't even begin to tell you how many I saw come and go in 25 years. Um, 
kept going to A&M and uh, coming back and uh, we improved our equipment at that time. And if y'all remember, I think it was, I'm terrible with dates, so I'm gonna just hit the decade <laughs> of when. Y'all remember when the school burned here? Uh, it first burned on a Thursday night and uh, then it caught fire again on the following Sunday, Saturday or Sunday. Um, the 56 Ford was sitting right over there in front of your, the uh, Presbyterian Church. It was 100, over 100 degrees that day. Uh, it sat and pumped solidly for, in fact, they, they went and got some gas and poured in it while it was still pumping. <laughs> so it would pump 500 gallons a minute. And so it sat there and pumped about eight or nine hours straight. And uh, that fire got us a, there, or we were, we were telling the city this, uh, you know, years prior to that, that start saving money so we can buy us a new engine, because we need a new engine. And they were, you know, state of the art at the time. So that fire, unfortunately, a lot of times to make things happen, you have, something else has to happen. So that fire got us our first, what's called a Class A engine in 1985. And it was an 85 model Ford cab over with uh, jump seats in the back, diesel automatic transmission, uh, 1,000 gallons a minute pump. And um, we were just proud as punch as we could, we could be to get that. Um, that was your first new? Well, it was our first new big truck. Big truck. Yeah, we had bought uh, one ton grass trucks uh, prior to that that were new and built. But the Grumman Company uh, built that truck for us. And it was bought through bid process and uh, lease purchased for 10 years. And uh, we didn't know, <laughs> kind of like buying a house, we didn't know if it ever get paid for or not. <laughs> but uh, through the years, the city got more and more involved in our, uh, you know, uh, money, giving us money. The uh, county, uh, we got commissioners that. Uh, would uh, realize the, the need for more money, more per run money and more lump sum money. Uh, when y'all remember when Jeff Kruger was on the was on the uh, uh, commissioner, he did up to that point, up, well up to the time I got out, he did more as a commissioner in getting us money than any other commissioner had in the in the in the uh, past. And I'm commending that over and over for, for that. But anyway, he was real instrumental in helping all the county fire departments out. Um, what else? Um, around, that, around that time, mid-80s, <coughs> fire phones went out and we went on a pager system. Um, up to that point, the radios that were in the truck were what's called low-band radios. And they're on a frequency uh, down low in the spectrum and they, on a good day they might talk three miles and they had um, skip come in on them all the time and we'd hear who knows who and some of them would even talk to some guys in Alabama every once in a while when they were coming back from a fire you know just to, like you used to do on the CB radios you know um, so we went to pagers now these low band radios well, the county had them the county didn't had these radios installed in the dispatch booth over there. And of course, at that time, you know, they're not near as busy as, as it is now. They may have been two units in the whole county, on patrol at night especially. And if they had those low band radios turned up, then we could talk to them. If they didn't have them turned up, we couldn't talk to them. Mm -hmm. So we got the pagers and we got Denton County online to uh, uh, pages. So then 3333 3, 3, 3 would, in the afternoon, and when the city hall would close, 3333 uh, 3, 3, 3 would be switched and it would ring at Denton mm -hmm. dispatch office. During the day, it would ring up there and then they would call the county and tell them where the fire was. Mm -hmm. uh, you may remember the, uh, the old siren that used to be right here behind the, the service station. Uh, it would. It would first, when we get a call on the, on the end, up to up to the time it quit working, uh, first one at the fire station would go where and land. It was a doorbell button in the fire station, and it just 
So I go over and lean on it, you know, and in a minute you hear it, you know, and it wind up, and everybody's working outside, you know, would, would come in and go. Um, the pagers were, uh, were a good thing. Uh, we, one person was taking the call, you know, the emotional fire out here, so-and-so, and then they would hit our pagers, and they would beat, and at that point in time, that pager was about that big and about that thick. So it was not near, now they're, you know, tiny. But uh, then they would dispatch us, and they would say where the fire was, and uh, then we could get on at the same band at the same time we went to high band radios, which uh, in the middle of the spectrum, and they would talk 20 miles on a good day. So we could talk to the county anytime we wanted to. And uh, we would, uh, when they would page us, we would go up and, and check in route, and that way they would have a time. And we, we checked in route so we could go back and say, well, it took us, uh, you know, 10 minutes to, from the page to get to Miss Kirby's house. And uh, so we could, you know, we started keeping <coughs> accurate records at that time. Um, the fire, I'll go back to the fire phones for a minute. Some of the funniest things that you can imagine that happened on the fire phones. We would get calls at 1 o'clock in the morning for a dog being out, <laughs> for somebody's cows being out. Why is the water pressure so low? Uh, you name it. I mean, we we uh, would get it. Uh, Y'all know, uh, know Joe Spratt? <laughs> you know, you know how Joe is. You know how Joe Spratt is. He's he's pretty. You know, he kind of says what he thinks. And uh, one night we got a fire phone call. It was the middle of the night, and uh, this Sanger Fire Department. And this this guy says, "Yes, yeah, said, uh, there's a there's a guy out here. So and so, uh, he's beating up on a woman out here beside on the highway." And Joe Spratt says. Has he set her on fire yet? <laughs> and uh, well, no. So you don't need the fire department. You need the police department. <laughs> so anyway, uh, that's some of the funny stuff that, that happened on the fire phones. Fire phones was a source of facts a lot because the person that usually said Sanger Fire Department and, and took the run and, and they was the one that stayed on the phone the longest, so they rarely got to make the call. Because <laughs> everybody else would get up there and head out the door. And, uh, well, how did you know, I mean, when everybody would get the call and you'd all go to the fire station, what, you'd just load up the truck and take out the ones that hadn't gotten there yet? They'd, bring, them, they'd bring the next one, oh. you know. And if a lot of people showed up, every truck went, you know. There wasn't any, you know, if we knew if it was a grass fire, all the grass trucks would go and the tanker truck. Did every volunteer have one of those uh, high band radios? No, they had a pager. Pager. They was all issued a pager. All the radio, high band radios were in the trucks. And uh, uh, that's that's why they could, uh, they could talk so well. Um, what else? Um, I bet in the beginning it was pretty chaotic, wasn't it? Well, it, chaotic. Mm, it was, it was, it was, I would call it controlled chaos because, uh, of course, you know, if you got a, if you got a call in the middle of the night, says, you know, why is the water pressure low? Of course, we didn't respond to that, other than maybe Joe would tell them <laughs> what they could do with it. But anyway, uh, if it was, I'm sorry? <laughs> So anyway, you need, I'll tell you after me. Uh, anyway, um, we knew what we were doing. I mean, what we were going to do. Uh, it was a call in as a house fire, uh, and we knew that a lot. Of, you know, a lot of people would come to that. And uh, another transition was is when uh, Denton County 911 came into effect. That's just been. A you know, maybe 20, well, probably 15 years ago now. Uh, but, uh, and that's when they come in and changed all of your addresses. Uh, and that was a big transition because uh, people would, would call in, another, this is another Joeism, 
people would call in and, and say, uh, okay, there's a, I got a, I got a high fire out here. Okay, what's your address? Uh, we're Route 1, Box you know, <laughs> 429. And Joe would say, we're going to have to have more than that. We can't mail you a fire truck. <laughs> and uh, so, you know, that's another <laughs> joke. So, uh, and that's, uh, as I said earlier, that's all of us that grew up around here, you know, if you, okay, they give us their address and say, okay, who's your neighbor? Or what place do you live on? Well, I live on the Toon Place. We're going to go south. Or I live on the what said the way place, we're going northwest. Or I live on out by the Kirby's, there we're going east. So those of us that, that you know knew that. Uh, so there was a big uh, push to learn all the roads because they had to name about half of them <laughs> when they went to 911. They didn't have a name, so they come up with all these names, and uh, that was a, a big transition. Um, I remember, especially as a teenager, when the fire alarm went off, everybody jumped in their car and followed the trucks. Followed the fire trucks. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I heard that's against the law. It is. <laughs> it, <laughs> was, <laughs> it was then. It was then, too. But, you know, <laughs> yeah, but, you know, everybody has something to do, you know, especially on a Saturday night or something. Oh, you know. It wasn't in the 40s and 50s, though. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> anyway, everybody followed the trucks. And a lot of times, if, you know, they'd get put to work. Stopped. <laughs> so, grab a sack, start moving yeah. on. <laughs> uh, about, about around that time, too, uh, like I say, I went to, also, I went to EMT school in 1981 and a uh, Mercy Medical Technician. The uh, fire service at that time, all over the country, especially around Texas, was moving into the EMS business. Uh, as y'all know, here in the about probably up into the 70s, funeral home run the ambulance. And uh, it was basically, you know, somebody's laid out for some reason or another, the ambulance pulls up, slides up, throw the door open, throw them in the back, go to the hospital. Yeah. One, you know, sometimes one person on the whole, on the ambulance, and they go to the hospital, and that's why they had these Pontiacs with 500 cubic inch <coughs> motors in them, and they'd go to the hospital 100 and 35 or 40 miles. <coughs> and that was what we referred to as load and go. Load and go. All right, after that, um, I'm not sure the date of the time, um, around the late, mid-70s, uh, Westgate, you know, Westgate Hospital, they took over the ambulance service. So anybody in Denton County that got a, that had an ambulance call, they had stated, you know, the, 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 the latest and greatest ambulances at the points, and that's when the that's when the design that you see is called the box. It's a one-ton truck with a box on the back. So that was referred to as the box. So they run the box, and it, it consisted of a, what's called advanced life support. They had trained paramedics in it. <coughs> they could start IVs. <coughs> they could. Uh, <coughs> do airways if you're unconscious, they could push drugs, they could read the heart monitor, everything they can do today. Uh, plus there's a lot more they do today. But anyway, that ran for a while and then the fire department took over the hands and after a few years of that. Then uh, Denton was coming up here. And around that time too, we had some more people go to EMT school and then we started the first responders which we had a 74, I don't think it's, I got trucks in there, had a 74 Chevrolet van with no power steering and no air conditioner and no insulation in it. I mean, he got it, we could always tell when he was going too fast because the sides would go, whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> So anyway, that was, we knew to tell him to slow down. So anyway, the thing would run over 100 miles an hour and we were quite uh, fortunate that we didn't Hurt. <laughs> but anyway, uh, first responders, we were EMTs, we could go to the scene, we could bandage, we could splint, we could do CPR, we could give oxygen, we could advise the, the, the ambulance that was coming from Denton 
on the, the condition of the patient, um, whether or not they needed. Care flight came into the scene at this time, you know, and they were getting going, and whether or not we needed the care flight helicopter and all that stuff. So things were really, really snowballing. And uh, we uh, transitioned through that, and uh, a few years before I quit, or right as I was, I was leaving in 2004, um, Sanger was transitioning into having their own ambulance. So that's kind of the, the way that the EMS got into the picture. When we started running EMS calls, our calls tripled just in one year period of time uh, because we were getting um, all the headache calls and, you know in the middle of the night and things like that and, and uh, EMS was a, was a big challenge because not everybody wanted to do EMS. It's pretty easy to go out and squirt water on fire but if EMS came along then it took another special kind of person to be able to, to do that and we had uh, Bill Lloyd, Danny Spindle, Jeff McNeil, Chet Schweitzer, and myself. And that was there was five EMTs in there. And it wasn't any assigned time to go. Uh, it was just when the patient went off, you know, we would go. Fire truck would follow us, you know, if it was uh, a wreck or something. Um, and that, uh, I guess the EMS was probably the, the biggest change that we went through in that period of time, uh, transitioning into that, because all of a sudden, you know, if you come out here and you go all the way to Wade Road on a wood house that's on fire in the middle of the night, what's the chances that it's going to still be there when you get there? So, you know. Hey, well, I'm not, I'm not going to bite that from inside. I'm just going to do that. Well, you couldn't do that with EMS. Because if I walk up, you know, if we go on a call and somebody's laying there and they got, you know, pardon me, but they got blood squirting out of them, then you got to do something. You're trained to do it and you're supposed to do it. And if you don't do it, then we, after, uh, you know, a few of us realize that you go to court, whether you're at fault or anything or not, uh, we never, by the way, we never had anybody that, that got in trouble, but we did have some people, myself included, had to go and testify in court about runs that we had made. And uh, it didn't take us long to realize that was a serious business, and uh, you, you couldn't very well choose or not choose to not you know, perform that duty. Um, what else? My big deal. I guess through all through the thing was training. And I wanted everybody to be trained to where my, my idea was always to, uh, number one, protect yourself and the guy that's with you, and then the, whoever you're trying to save, if there's some people involved, and then the property. So the main thing was to be able for everybody to come back from the run whole and not hurt, so the, 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 you know, that you could come back to the family. Because it is a dangerous job, and it didn't matter. It, we found out real quick that it didn't matter if you drew a paycheck for it or not. The fires are just as hot; they're just as dangerous. Uh, you know, very few fire departments would run 17 miles one way to a call in the middle of the night with two people, uh, and that's the Rocky Ridge. You know, the Rocky Ridge motorcycle thing out on 51 between uh, Slidell era. That's 17 miles from the fire station. And you go out of our county, back into our county, to get there. Because there's a, just a leg of it that goes up through there, and that thing is in Bend County. So anyway, that was a, that was a, a big deal, EMS. Um, well, what about when they had the woman, Kim, what action did she take? Did she... Well, um, we had actually two women to get in, with, with, uh, Kim and, and a, a girl named Alice. Alice was a nurse, so they uh, they chose to do EMS, and they would fire train with us, you know, and and they were uh, they were trained to do everything we could do, and uh, we let them, 
you know, to go as far as they want to go. And uh, uh, we, uh, as we, as, as we came through it, we realized that everything needed to be done by at least two people. Like if this place is on fire and I'm coming in it with my gear on and my hair pack, I'm not going to go by myself. Just common sense tells you that. So, you know, we would pair up with them, and uh, they they fulfilled a role, you know, just like we did. Well, I know a time or two, you know, that she left work. Yeah. And go, and she come back. She didn't look like she had a hair out. <laughs> yeah. She, uh, yeah. She, uh, she was that way, and uh, she always. You mentioned her. She always wore a bow in her hair, uh -huh. right? and. Uh, uh, I always told her I was going to get her a Nomex bow so it wouldn't burn up. <laughs> so uh, we'd get them an exercise hood so they you know, put their hair in and stuff. So. What were the numbers of people involved as this uh, gradually went from well, basically a volunteer to a professional fire, yeah. fire department now? When I got in, we when, and pretty much throughout the whole time that I was in, we had spaces for 25 firemen. And uh, we would, uh, you know, we would have 25, and then we'd, we'd go down to 17, 18. And uh, that's another evolution of the, of the fire department was uh, the fact that, in, like you said, people would go follow the fire trucks. Uh, during the day, the men that would work in town, or like Merwin was a cabinet maker, Jimmy Smith was, <coughs> was a mechanic. Randy Gentle was in the grocery store. And, uh, you know, something would go off during the day, and we were at work out of town, most of us. So that was the slack time that we, there wasn't enough help. And uh, as my second job was for Joe Ashcraft, so I was in town then. And uh, that was, like I say, that was a, a time that was challenging. Especially if we had a big fire. And at that point, um, nowadays, when they have a call, whichever direction in town they're going, that the, the neighboring department would automatically come and help them. They're standing, you know, uh, uh, dispatch that they will, if it's a major incident, you know, they'll, if you're going east, Pile Point Aubrey will come help, Crumb. Uh, then, Denton Manlis went in front of my house at Bolivar the other day, you know, so they were coming, they're still coming to help. Um, Why do they have the fire engine to follow the ambulance when it runs? For, uh, that's different protocols for different people, mainly it's for help, for manpower. Um, I know like they go to the iron house. Because they're multi trained aren't they? They're yeah, paramedics yeah. Too. everybody, nowadays, uh, all certified firemen or paramedics, or at least EMTs. Sometimes there will be three or four going yeah. in a yeah. group family. Yeah, and that's it's just for manpower, especially on a heart attack, that if you're having to uh, maybe do CPR uh, to, uh, you know, to relieve each other, to get them loaded and to get them to the hospital. Um, car wrecks, you know, they'll go because jaws of life, that's something else that we, that we brought in while I was in. It takes a whole, you know, crew to run those. Well, what's the current status? Are there any volunteers anymore, or is it? I haven't checked lately, but uh, there's it. There are three, three or more fully paid people at Sanger now. Those are all uh, paramedics, and they're all assigned to the animals. They hire uh, off-duty people from other places for 12 hours at a time, mm -hmm. and that's uh, that's to also man the ambulance. And uh, <clears> the <throat> last time I heard, they, they were down quite a bit to <coughs> own volunteers. I think they may have maybe six or eight volunteers. Um, that's something else I watched change over the years is uh, people that had time to volunteer. And uh, like I said, when the, when the whistle would go off in the evening around supper time, you know, we'd get 15 people at a fire. Uh, Middle of the night, if it was a big one, we'd get you know, a bunch of people fight fire all night. 
go home, take a shower, go to work. Uh, as times changed, though those times went away because people were busier. They had jobs they couldn't leave anymore. Uh, after I went to work for Joe, I worked for the post office part time, and I was also I was able to be here for some of that when Benny let me go. Bridges, <laughs> he got on to me a couple of times for leaving. But anyway, uh, then I went to work for the city, so I was able to leave and go at any time during the day. And we had you know, some some people that were able to do that. Um, but what? What is your estimate as far as size? What's the five biggest fire singers had? In my, as far as you can well, remember, uh, as far as you can remember, the, the school school was for number that's one, two. number one, or, <laughs> that's, or two. That's two of them. That's one and two. two. Okay. Uh, I, I don't know what kind of order they'd be in, but um, that early Not necessarily the order, just the size. Is what yeah, I was talking yeah. about. That was a big one. That Gen was a Gen big would be three. Huh? Gentles would be three. Uh, Smith, yeah. Smith's I mean, Smith, store. Yeah. yeah. Smith's. That'd be one. Um, that before one. the lake went in, we had a uh, grass fire out there that, that lasted three days. Mm -hmm. And oh, that's, uh, that's, we were being back and forth to that. And, yeah, uh, that's pretty much it. Then. And yeah. well, uh, the, the one that, that affected me the most was uh, around February, about Valentine's Day of 1996. They, it was in. Um, of course, February, and it was abnormally warm. The humidity through that month averaged about 10%. And uh, after you get, you know, after I got experience on grass fires, and any time the humidity dropped below about 20%, then you better put your shoes on because you're going to get a fire. And then when the humidity is that low, uh, a cigarette out the window can start it. A Coke bottle laying in a field on a sunny day, the sun going through it would start it. Uh, especially, you know, with the, with the uh, uh, humidity that low. On that day, and not to say, the, I know it was February, it was around the 14th, I'm not sure. Um, we got a hay fire out here on the, the hill east of town. Yeah, I remember it. What's the What's the ex mayor of Denton's name? Oh, uh, yeah, I remember it. Ed Stevens. Stevens. Ray Stevens. Ray Stevens, yeah. Ray Stevens had some hay right there in that corner pasture mm -hmm. where, where Marion Road and 455. We go out there and there'd been a little grass fire, me and Carrie Lee Shirts, and uh, we, uh, uh, the grass, you know, of course, moved over there and got the hay bales. Hay bales was something that if it was burned all the way around, <laughs> you leave them alone. Because you can make a hay bale fire last all night long if you want them. <laughs> or it'll burn up by itself in about three hours. But we made a lot of them last all night because, you know, we would fight. But anyway, so we go out there to that. And while we're there, we catch another car that's in, uh, they call it in on Houston Road. Houston Road's out to south of Oliver off of Indian Trail, uh, you know, the, the, the trailer community and some houses and, you know, they're acre, two acre, three acre lots. So we get, to, we come through town and uh, we get to Harris Hill, we can see it, and it's already massive. Mm -hmm. So we get out there and, of course, they always look bigger than they really were. So we get out there and we, uh, we get it put out <laughs> without losing anything. And uh, we start back to town. And uh, the guy that started it was, uh, he claimed he was mowing his yard. Now, the grass is dead. And the grass don't need mowing. Maybe his wife told him to. But he, anyway, he said he was mowing his yard. So anyway, we get it put out. We get almost back to town. We get to uh, Jess Coffee's place. And we get turned around and go back. And by the time we can see it this time, it was three times bigger than it was when we first saw it. So we get out there, and uh, <clears throat> the whole was we used to, you know, Charles Kessler. When uh, when the the septic procedure, when you get to a fire through the first one there, is called size up. 
and you would get on the radio and say, we have one story brick house smoke showing. And that way everybody knows coming in what you got. Charles's favorite size up was, hey, the whole world's on fire. <laughs> he wasn't on that run, but yeah, that came to my mind when, I, when, I, when, I talked, when we talked that hill. We get out there, and indeed the whole world, as we know it, was on fire. And like I say, the, the uh, humidity's like under 10%. The grass is dead, and it's a foot tall. And uh, we ended up losing about seven trailer houses. Uh, there, was a, there was a whole list of everything. Seven trailer houses, almost 20 vehicles, uh, six or seven barns, half a dozen boats, some farm animals. And uh, this, uh, <clears throat> by the time we got it put out, that's what was burnt. And that, that particular day in Dick County, every fire department in county was out. And there were 24, used to be 24 fire departments in Dick County. They were, every one of them was out. And the county was handling every, every dispatch on all of them. So that one affected me pretty much more than any of them that I've been on. Uh, because that, about six months after that, every time I close my eyes, go to sleep, I see fire. I wake up middle of the night sweating, and you know, just the feeling of being powerless. We could squirt all the water we were capable of squirting, and it was just like, you know, having a water gun on a bonfire. You know, it just wasn't enough. Well, did that, is there, is there water fire hydrants out in the country that can be used? So do you have to go back to town and reload? Well, that's why we have. Uh, um, something else that we developed was water tankers, and that was the big truck. And I told you it wouldn't start half the time. Okay. That was uh, that was how much water, you know, and uh, that's how much water we could take through the fire <clears throat> on the initial run. And that's what insurance companies would know, want to know, when they would call us and somebody's moving in and say, "I'm I'm doing insurance for how much water can y'all take through the fire?" Or where's the nearest fire station? First, I tell them well, there's only ones in San. Where's the nearest fire hydrant? Again, the closest one's in Sanger. Well, they're living on, you know, 10 miles of the country. So they say, I, so I kind of developed with them. Well, how about I tell you how much water we can take with us? So at times we could take five, six, seven thousand gallons with us. So that sounds like a lot, but it's not. Um, so anyway, that fire burned for about, well, the initial fire was about eight hours. And then uh, it, spot fires came up. And uh, come to find out the guy that started the fire both times was burning trash. And uh, he started the first time burning trash. And the minute we left, he lit it back up and started it again. And he went to jail. Uh, one of the houses that burned up belonged to uh, one of the county officials uh, in Denton County. And it's in the, some of the judicial. So he was, he was uh, destined for jail. But uh, anyway, that that was a big one. Well, you wonder how stupid can people be. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I know why you set the white place on fire twice. Yeah. That's really good. And that, that, that was the norm, though, you know, because that people just burned their trash. You know, all of you people that live out in the country burn your trash. Well, my grandpa, he used to set his grass on fire because yeah. it was burned it off. So yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Yeah. yeah. When you I, know, he'd stand to, out there with water hose. When I would get yeah, plow for Hooter, he went to this went through this phase one year of burning all this wheat stubble until he mm -hmm. had to buy about ten air filters and air conditioner filters for the machinery. <laughs> the way you do that no more. You couldn't even see where you were plowing because of all the black. You know? <laughs> but anyway, that was, that was a, not, not a good sign. Anyway, um, rural firefighting is a challenge. It always has been around here. Uh, there's there's a methods nowadays to where uh, the tankers carry a folding tank, and uh, they set this folding tank out, and uh, they can, they got a great big dump well on the back of the truck, so they can dump their whole load of water in this dump tank, and then they can go to get some more nearest the hydrant where they can fill, come back and dump it again, and we can you know we would put our suction hoses over in the like a swimming pool. It's about about that high. Hold about five thousand gallons total, and uh, you go to stock tanks. We did some stock tanks. Uh, that was that was good and bad. And Swimming pools water. were good. <laughs> you know, they were better. Yeah, oh yeah. Stock tanks are dirty. <clears throat> you know, 
and we would pull mud and dirt into the pumps and things, it would be bad for those. Uh, yeah, we drafted out of a swimming pool, more than one swimming pool, and uh, I was you know, kind of like to see that. <laughs> it uh, rolled up saw a swimming pool. But water sources and manpower, you know, was always a challenge in the country because you just couldn't hook up to a water source and have all you needed. And, but there were times in Sarah when we were hooked up to a water source and we didn't have all we needed to. So, but they evolved with us and they fixed where we could turn on pumps and get the water. So, the city's always worked with us. We're proud to say that the city has, has grown with us and time I was in there anyway, they, they really, really helped us out. I don't know well, you're, you're, I well, you had a factory or anything, but what was, what, what was the problem with this country store? What was the problem? Did, did it start in the middle of the night or what? I was gone when it happened. No, it didn't. It started, what time of the day was it? It was at night. But uh, I think they traced that back to electrical, somewhere around where the beauty shop was. Yeah, oh, uh, Three quarters of the way into the building. Going to the north. Like us on Apple Cherry. <laughs> and of course, you know, Smith's was. It was dry as a bone. You know, the wood was a hundred year old building, you know, not dry. the wood was dry. Yeah. Uh, what we would call a high, high fire load. And, you know, 90% of the stuff in there burned. Burn. You know, especially those <laughs> kerosene tanks he had in the back. <laughs> I was standing in the park resting when one of those went up and it looked like a mushroom cloud. You know. <laughs> it was made out of plastic, about half full of kerosene diesel and kerosene. Did he sell kerosene? He sold them. Yes, he sure did. <laughs> I bought kerosene. Had an elevated tank. I never even thought about that. Had a plastic <laughs> elevated 500 gallon ker of kerosene tank in the building <coughs> in the back. Is that why you see at grocery stores the tanks are all outside? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That GPA. Yeah. Um, <coughs> Anybody got anything else? Any more questions? I remember one time my stepdad was in Wilson. Oh, okay. I just remember the fire alarm going off and him getting in the hall closet and getting this white yeah. one piece suit on. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking, why white? Mm -hmm. Why would they wear white to a fire? But he would get that all zipped up and take off. And one night he came home and there had been a pickle truck that turned over right out here on 35 mm -hmm. and it caught on fire and so the pickle truck driver told all the firemen have all the pickles you want <laughs> i bet we ate pickles for three years we had pickle slices the little tiny ones the great big ones <laughs> yeah. cool. that's good that's good uh, Something along that line, we made one one night out there, well, right in front of the care Inn. There was a one, you know, a single axle box truck going north. It got off the road and turned over. And we get out there, and the uh, truck's turned over, and its load spilled all over the service road. And, uh, not blue bell ice cream. No, no, no. <laughs> we start walking up there, though, Russell, and <coughs> it's at night, and the lights are blinking and shining, and the ground's moving. Uh, oh. And we kind of step back and get our flashlights out, and there's crabs all over the oh, oh, my God. God. Crabs. Crabs. Oh. Live crabs. <laughs> this truck was full of seafood. Oh. It had been to the coast, and it was going to a, a Chinese restaurant in Oklahoma City. <laughs> so we had crabs and fish, and I mean, there was these, you've seen the fish markets where this long fish with good it's gutted yeah we those were laying on the ground and live crabs and and uh how many did you take on i think somebody to us you know who was going to eat it at the best but, i mean crabs wouldn't stay alive very long but uh, you know it was it was an interesting call you know? <laughs> two guys that were in the the front of the truck they spoke chinese and uh so, you know, had trouble talking to them, but, uh, you know, that, that was an interesting one. Um, Are there a lot of calls, especially nowadays, out on the freeway? I mean, is that where most... It has, it has been a big source of calls, and then it hasn't. Um, 
the amazing, you know, it always amazed me that that uh, the straightest stretch of road that for 35 is is from the county line to Sanger, you know. And there's some bad, terrible wrecks, you know, right out there in front of your house. They'll back up from the county line. Yeah, you know, and even back when there wasn't so much traffic on it, you know, there was some horrendous wrecks on that straight, flat road, you know, it was just, then the, before they started protecting the bridge pillars, you know, with the, with the cement now that you'll hear you off of them, when they were just sitting there, you know, those things don't move an inch, and the car hits them, and it's just like There's several people killed out there. Yeah. Right there by your house. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. The most touching thing I saw one time was. Just a little girl in the. Was a. Horse trailer? 16, no, 16 year old boy was driving a car, and he had gotten off the road and hit one of the pillars, mm -hmm. and it killed his mother, his little sister, his daddy. And I think there was one more in the car that was very severely injured, and he was not. He was 16 years old. That must have been the one that happened right out in front of the house. That was right there at View Road Overpass, matter yeah. of fact. Rob went down there, and you yeah. come back and, and said that. He said, well, the, you know, <clears throat> the, this boy uh, was not hurt. He was old, big enough, you know, not, he was scratched up. But he was standing in the road, and of course it was all blocked. Highway Patrol walks up and starts asking him what happened, and he, he couldn't even talk. He was so upset and crying. And I, that Highway Patrol, I don't know who it was, but he laid his clipboard down, and he just grabbed that boy and held him until he, you know, just held him. And that was some of the, you know, of course, you see, I saw touching things the whole time, but I remember that. It's in my mind. Um, one, uh, one more that we that I made one time. Me and John Buckley made a call down to the horizon. A lady had come off the freeway, and her, her daughter, she's she's a big lady, and her daughter said she just passed out. Well, we get there, she has no pulse, no breathing. So we, me and John, start CPR on her. <coughs> As we would do the CPR, she woke up. We said, "Hey, this is good, you know." So we quit. Well, she passed out. And so we started again, CPR. She woke up again, started talking to us. What are y'all doing to me? Yeah. And we said, hey, this is good. But we stopped again, she passed out again. We did that, we did that, you know, four or five. Of course, she stopped CPR on somebody when they got in the pulse. But we were making her heart work good enough for her to wake up to talk to us. And then when we would stop, she would pass back out. Yeah. Basically die again. You know. But anyway, they, she wound up not living. Well, that, was a, that was kind of a bizarre cause. I could tell war stories all night ago. I'll <laughs> probably get tired of what hearing that. What interesting. <laughs> yeah, it's, you know, it's a, I always called it the best job in the world because, you know, it's something different every time you go. You know, uh, one of the drawbacks to working in your hometown like this is a lot of times you would work with friends and people with Sunday. I worked with Sunday school teacher, did CPR on my Sunday school. And then if you've got kids in school, you go out and some of your kids' friends is in a wreck, you know. Yeah. That was, that was a, you know, that was rough. But, uh, I don't know if anybody remembers Ma Birch. Oh, yeah. Do you remember her? Ma Birch? Ma Maud. Birch. She lived on 3rd Street. Down, she was a beauty out, right? Yeah, she had a little beauty shop on one side of her house and, and, uh, Anyway, she grew chinchillas. I remember that fire. I, w I was a kid. My grandmother lived right down the street, and, and she went to Mall to get her hair done. And one night during the night, I mean, I was probably eight or nine years old, so this was mid fifties, and that chinchilla house caught on fire. And my grandmother just lived like a block, two blocks down, and I can remember hearing those things. Completely burned them up. I don't know how many she had, but she was raising them to sell for coats. Yeah. I'll tell you one more, and I'll let y'all have it. Uh, Miller was asking about one of the ones. I was out of town for this particular fire, and y'all all know that <coughs> the one off of uh, 10th Street that uh, it was on October the 10th of around, what was it, about 80, 85? It was after we moved from yeah. that red house. Yeah, Buckle 
those house they lived in before, before they built them up on the mountain. Catherine. Yeah, Catherine. The Leahy family lived there. Mm -hmm. And uh, the little kids burned up in it. And uh, mm -hmm. uh, I was, like I say, I was out of town down at A&M at, at a hydraulic school. And I was listening to WBAP before I went to, to, to into the class that morning. And they were talking about a fire. And I just, I didn't hear where it was, but I, I Something told me I was in Sanger. And sure enough, that uh, that fire was, and it changed. That that uh, that ended a lot of our firemen's career in that in the department, because that was the first real, you know. How many children died in that one? A little boy and a little girl. And wasn't one of them pulled out? Did Johnny get one of them out? Yeah, they got, I, th I think there was three died in it. Uh, Johnny got one, and my brother worked worked that child in the, in the front yard, and then they went in and found the other two later. Uh, Johnny, Johnny, of course, lived on Freeze, and he, he came by, and he just stopped on his way to the fire station. And uh, there was a lot of, there was a lot of. He grew up in that house, so yeah. he was in his floor plate. Right, but he said by the time he got there, the fire was already. And as a house fire, as a fire burns in a house, the more it burns, the further down the smoke comes. And you'll leave actually, like if this room was on, if that kitchen was on fire and you come in right here, as to how long the fire had been burning, the smoke will start go, will be down. And you'll crawl under it and it, the, the temperature on the floor will be 100 degrees. The temperature six feet off the ground will be 300 degrees. So at that point, the smoke was three quarters of the way down in the house. And so, you know. The kids, they, they determined the kids all died of smoke inhalation way before the fire got them. So, uh, yeah, that was, a, that was a big one. That was probably the biggest one for the department. There was a lot of guys got out of it after that. Yeah. But, uh, like I said, that was, I was out of town. And uh, Nell Armstrong, <laughs> she found, one day she said, uh, you're going to have to quit going out of town. Every time you do, we have a bad fire. <laughs> and, uh, of course, she was kind of like, she was the mother to a lot of us, you know that. So she mothered us, and called us down when we needed, <laughs> and, and pat us on the back, hug her neck when we were we, we needed to. So, anyway. okay. Anything else? I was very pleased to come and talk to you. I'm sorry if I rambled on, but. Uh, Thank you.
you know, for like an hour in the morning, and then after lunch, they would have a slayer heads on the desk, and that same group would cry. And so what she would